Okay, everybody, welcome once again to another episode of Mondays with Moshe. I got to tell you, I have not counted. I know there are those people who count, like you know, every episode and what number they're up to. I have not counted how many episodes we, we're do, we've done uh, thus far. I know that we're going since I believe it's July of twenty twenty. So we're going at least a year and a half plus strong. I'm going to guess we're somewhere between fifty and sixty episodes. Um, we've had some of the greatest contributors to mental health field on this show, and tonight we actually have a really interesting niche. We have a Dr. Brooks Gibbs, who's a psychologist out in somewhere in Florida, right? Yeah, Clearwater. Clearwater, Florida, which is actually the same same time zone as we are, believe it or not. So, you know, we've had people from Australia who are almost the same time zone, but a full day later and a different season. But today we got Dr. Brooks Gibbs. Thank you, Brooks, for agreeing to participate and be with us. And um, tonight's topic is the process of bullying or treating victims of bullying in therapy. Uh, Dr. Gibbs is a psychologist and um, works ex you know, pretty much exclusively with social skills and bullying. And I have to say, um, I watched many of his clips online. Uh, I have a little surprise to share tonight with, with all of you, uh, a short little clip. Uh, I don't know if, if Brooks knows what I'm talking about, but he will soon. And um, uh, you know, it was one of my hesitations because Brooks is not a practicing psychotherapist per se, although he does work a lot with, with children, interacts with parents, children, teachers, school faculty, all the time on the topic of bullying and social skills. Um, so I was, you know, was a bit hesitant because we like to focus on the process of psychotherapy, but then there was a particular clip that I saw uh, that just made me fall in love with Brooks and his work, and I'm gonna show that to you a little bit later. Um, so uh, keep your videos on and, and stay, stay tuned. Um, Brooks, tell us a little bit about how you entered the field, what brought you to social skills and bullying, what was your particular interest in it, who were your mentors um, and teachers in this area? Well, hello everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Brooks and I'm a social psychologist. Um, my hyper niche is social related emotional resilience as a key ingredient to resolve conflict amongst youth. And um, in general, if we raise the frustration tolerance of children where they're not so irritable, uh, we find that when there's no offense, there's no conflict. And it's uh, what I call a backdoor approach to solve a very common problem. The front door approach, of course, is to try to make the mean kids nice and reform the mean kids, like enforcing the golden rule, so to speak. And that doesn't work very well. You certainly wouldn't want the golden rule enforced and uh, uh, so that's a violation of the golden rule. We can't just make people nice. You wouldn't want to make someone try to make you nice. So the backdoor approach is, well, how about we focus on the kid who's the target of the aggression and we cure him of his offendability. We build up his emotional resilience so much that he's just not bothered anymore by the common uh, non-criminal aggressive behaviors. I like to call them squabbles, but today everyone calls them bullying. And that's been my focus now for 22 years. And I got started uh, in 1999, November 1999. Uh, I'm from Littleton, Colorado. Uh, if you remember, April 20th, 1999, the Columbine shooting happened. Um, and uh, remarkably, that was the birthplace of the anti-bullying movement. Uh, but it's also um, the same year that another movement started, the social emotional learning movement. And those two, in the education industry, those two industries were really uh, uh, diabolical in nature. Their, their approach to solve the problem was completely different. The, the anti-bullying movement took a uh, legal approach, uh, sort of that front door approach that says, we're gonna enforce niceness and pass rules and, and have policies and procedures and anti-bullying laws uh, to make it illegal uh, to hurt someone's feelings. And so we're gonna, we're gonna punish the mean kids and we're gonna promote uh, niceness. Uh, but if they're not nice, we're, you can report it even anon anonymously and, and the grownups are going to punish the bully. And uh, that was the front door approach. Uh, the social emotional learning 
uh, took a backdoor approach, which is, hey, let's let's teach kids how to manage their emotions, emotional regulation, basic uh, conflict resolution skills. Uh, but, but the problem is, uh, and by the way, and it's true, if you go to the archive.org and you look at the Wayback Machine and you put in Castle or Cassell, C-A-S-E-L.org, which is a collaborative for academic social and emotional learning, that's uh, their first time they ever published a website was at the end of 1999. And um, the first anti-bullying law, I believe, was in, um, I believe, October or November in the state of Georgia. So really, those two movements started. I, at that time, I was I just turned 19. And uh, I that was, was actually uh, my 19th birthday. April 20th, right 1999. We're, yeah, we're the same age. <laughs> we're like astro twins, I think they call us. But um, but yeah, you remember that was a big deal, that Columbine shooting. I mean, it, everyone seemed to be talking about it. And so uh, just to you know, wrap up kind of, I got my start there and I, um, I studied uh, sociology and then I realized I really cared more about psychology. And then I found this niche called social psychology. Um, and I continued to invest my education in that route, uh, ultimately earning my doctorate, but along the way, in my 30s, I was mentored by a school psychologist, Izzy Kalman, which was the biggest life changer ever. Uh, he's a Orthodox Jew, lives in Israel. Uh, Israel Kalman is uh, probably the foremost critic of the anti-bullying movement. We wrote a book. Uh, uh, I really wrote a memoir of our relationship. It's called Rethink Bullying, and people can download it for free at rethinkbullying.com. And uh, it basically shares... Uh, everything I learned from that key mentor. And his mentor was, um, I, I should say, a distant mentor, not a direct mentor, but an indirect mentor was uh, Dr. Albert Ellis uh, from, from New York, who uh, was the founder of Rational Motive Behavioral Therapy, the forerunner of the cognitive behavioral movement. And pretty much everything I teach is rooted in Izzy Kalman and Dr. Albert Ellis um, helping children uh, clean up their irrational thoughts, give up the grip of their irrational demands, and uh, raise their frustration tolerance, and ultimately live out the golden rule, which is treating each, uh, each other the way we want to be treated, assuming that you're being treated in a way you don't want to be treated. I hope that verbal throw up there was a, a good idea of, of where I'm coming from. Well, that, that was excellent, actually. And, and I'm curious, so you talked about the anti-bullying approach, which really was kind of more forceful, um, you know, top down, we're going to intimidate the intimidators versus the social emotional approach, which was let's create resilience in children. So that makes me wonder, does that mean that across the board, would you say that those children who are more resilient, let's say either naturally or based on their upbringing, that they had resilience sort of imbued in them, that those children are, are less vulnerable to being victims of bullies? Yeah, children who are emotionally resilient don't give a flying flip about the negative words and actions of others, as long as it's non-criminal, meaning my, my, my body or my property is not being objectively harmed. Uh, the only harm we're talking about is subjective harm, which is emotional harm, which is subject mm -hmm. to my thinking. Mm -hmm. My feelings only are hurt if I think that absolutely must not happen. And so, yes, children who are resilient uh, are not victims of uh, constant teasing and taunting. Uh, even if they're targets, they're still not victims, right? They, they don't victimize themselves. They don't upset themselves. Well, and and so it's presumably, once, once they're not victims, the, the bully goes to, you know, goes to pick on someone else. Sure. You know, as they say, uh, a bully needs a victim. And if there's no victim, you know, there's no bully. And, and, and what I teach, though, I say even the, the one that we are calling bully, <laughs> you know, which is a pejorative term like abuser or loser uh, or thief or liar. It's actually an immoral wor word as far as I'm concerned to call a child a bully is calling him a name and it's globally rating him with this one, you know, as the aggressor. And, uh, and I just don't think that's in touch with reality. These children have names. We should call them by their names. We, uh, in popular culture, have divided into innocent victim, guilty bully. But in all reality, you talk to a child who, I, who has been labeled a bully, and they actually identify as a victim. 
when you say, why did you say this to this girl? Well, because she said this to me and she did that to me. So I've always said, you know, we don't have a bully problem. We have a victim problem. And when you victim proof students, you bully proof schools. Fascinating. Those are such good mantras. Do you have those written down? And I mean, those are I've been doing mantras. this for 22 years. You know, uh, 2 million students face to face, uh, over 3000 presentations. Uh, my online videos have been translated into 20 different languages, amassed more than 300 million views. That's over 3,300 years of watch time, my math nerd friend tells me. So, you know, when you do this for this long, yeah. you bleed this topic. And I just, I just absolutely love it. I never get bored. That's how I know I'm in my purpose. Okay. Brooks, tell us a little bit about the concept of dominance behavior. Sure. There are, um, when we speak about bullying and, and they, and they try to give, they being the bullying experts in the, uh, legal definition of bullying, uh, the clinical, the academic definition of bullying, they're really describing dominance behavior. I learned this of course, from Izzy Kalman and he, he explained very simply that, uh, the three criteria that all of us have been trained with our anti-bullying education is there's an imbalance of power. There's intent to do harm and it's repeated over time. And in the state of Texas, they have this uh, rubric that, that says, if all three are not in play, it is not bullying. It's not the clinical definition, certainly in their case, the legal definition uh, that they need to uh, lower the boom of a consequence. And so, which to me is, is describing what sociologists have called dominance behavior. It's, it's the pecking order. It's the alpha male. It's the head hog at the trough. You, you know, it's, it's actually a law in nature that most people want to be on the high end of the social spectrum. No one wants to be on the low end of the social spectrum. So we are trying to jockey for a position of hi hi hierarchy and order, um, because it feels a lot better to be uh, you know, on the dominant side than uh, lower. And so that's when someone's trying to have an upper hand, a psychological upper hand, uh, not necessarily size wise, but uh, they use psychological tactics to, to, to be mean to you. And, and so I don't really like to uh, uh, complicate it more than that. It, it is really is as simple as sibling rivalry. Typically in a home situation, you've got a child who is, uh, loves to bother and another one that is easily bothered. And if that botherer uh, knows exactly what to say or do uh, to uh, evoke a negative reaction, then that botherer uh, has a satisfaction. And the more upset the, uh, the more upset you get, the more fun he has, the more fun he has, the meaner he is, the meaner he is, the more upset you get. And, and Izzy Kalman put it this way. He says, the ironic thing is uh, like a dog chasing his tail, he's trying to get his tail to stop moving. But the more he tries to chase it, the more it moves. All he has to do is stop chasing the tail and the tail will stop moving. And Izzy says, all we have to do is stop getting upset, stop giving the botherer the provocateur, uh, the, the, the uh, satisfaction of our negative reaction. Don't get upset, be kind to them, and they can't bother you. And this is what I demonstrate in that clip that you'll play yes. later. Yes. So I, what I wonder is, you know, you're describing competition, basically, you know, where I need to be on top of you and presumably because I feel more secure if I'm on the top, like you said, contrary to if I'm on the bottom where I feel really insecure. Is there or are there particular characteristics or or prototypes of kids, let's just call them, I'm sure this, this applies to adults also who bully, but let's just say in children who need for some reason to be on the top and other children who don't necessarily need, and then maybe a third child who can't, who doesn't know how to get to the top is very insecure. What makes somebody a bully? I, I've always viewed uh, the um, study of bullying and which is really dominance behavior is really essentially a study of leadership. Uh, it's an attempt to dominate. You know, it's a desire to dominate. And there's nothing wrong with that desire. We want leaders. It's just uh, what I guess you could call a primitive um, style of leadership. Uh, might makes right in the animal kingdom. And so the big, you know, uh, the big gorilla who can beat everybody up is the one that dominates. Uh, but you know what? Every one of those other gorillas are appreciative 
of that big gorilla because that big gorilla is going to be on the front lines of a battle if his tribe is attacked. There's an expectation of protection uh, with dominance. And so you have the same uh, with schoolyard aggression. You've got the queen bee. You know, uh, when you're cool with her, well, hey, you're protected. Um, but she'll use two primary strategies to maintain dominance, and that's the carrot stick. That's the carrot, which is incentives. If you uh, if you let me, you know, uh, wear that blouse, or you let me wear those shoes, or you let me borrow your, you know, for a kid, it'd, you know, a, a male maybe to be an Xbox, and then I'll let you be my friend, right? That's an incentive or a stick, which is, hey, uh, I'm going to spread a rumor about you if you know if if you keep hanging out with that other kid because I hate that other kid and I'm not willing to share friends. So you either uh, you know lose him or you lose me, and if you lose me, you lose everybody. So I love to put my arms around these queen bees and these big macho dudes that that find themselves dominated and teach them a different strategy of of dominating, which is really through not carrot and stick, but competency and service, man, if you're really good or competent at what you do, other people will give you the ball if you can throw it. And if you help other people along the way, meaning you have a servant heart to help them succeed as well, well, they'll place you in that place of dominance. And so I think that's one thing that we're lacking in education. I don't even offer it really in my training, leadership training, but I do think there's a place for uh, for that, for students that really naturally uh, yeah. dominate. And that's an interesting point because there, I think there's two kinds, you know, there's the kinds who are just naturally dominant, naturally to have those natural leaders, leadership skills. You can see them as little kids. They're usually uh, bossy and decisive and uh, pushy with their way. Uh, they just they're just very decisive and very clear about what it is that they want. But then you kind of have these other kids who seem to be bullying more out of insecurity, more out of uh, needing to finally have some control. Is there a way to tell the difference between uh, someone who's bullying out of you know it's not really a bullying me against you. It's just that I, I feel more secure than you versus one who's bullying because he feels so insecure. Yes, I, I do think so. And I think you bring up a nuance that's very important for every therapist to listen to. You know, we can't call all aggression or all unwanted behavior bullying. And we can't call it all dominance behavior. This is actually probably my greatest contribution to the field that someday will be recognized. But I have uh, really with Izzy's influence uh, heavily, uh, I've, I've, I've boiled down the three motivations behind all aggressions. And I have this diagram I'll show on the screen here. You've got in the red, you've got that dominance behavior. This is the one that loves to bother, <laughs> you know, but in the yellow, you've got uh, that joker, that comedian where they're just using humor and you're the butt of the joke. They're not really trying to be mean to you, but all humor is aggressive. And if you're the butt of the joke, it seems like they're being mean to you, but they're really just trying to have a laugh at your expense. But the third type of aggressor, the motivation behind all this aggression could be the blue guy, which is victimization, a feeling of hurt. You know, someone has been hurt by you and so they have a desire to retaliate or to see you punished in some way. And so they're being mean to you, not because they're trying to dominate you, not because they're, uh, you know, wanting to make you laugh, but really they're hurt by you and they're just reacting out of that hurt. And so that's a very important thing to show, you know, to understand. Um, and I always ask kids, you know, why, why do you think they're being mean? Are they trying to bother you? Are they trying to joke with you? Or are they hurt by you? Or is it a combination of those three? But it will never be more complicated than that. And so you're, you're, helping, you're, helping, you're helping them give some perspective, to take some perspective. Okay. Um, I just want to remind everybody, for those of you who joined and would like to ask questions, I see there's some comments coming in the chat screen. We like to take the questions live. Please raise your hand by using the reactions button on the bottom of the screen. Use the raise hand tab and we're happy to take your questions. Um, but before that, speaking of aggression, I'd like to do, use some digression for a minute. And I'd like to play a clip. It's not the one you were thinking, Brooks, but um, uh, you know, I had mentioned earlier that I wasn't sure whether Brooks Gibbs was an appropriate guest for the show because uh, I wasn't sure if he'd be able to talk about the process of psychotherapy and what goes on in the psychotherapeutic process. But then um, after doing a little bit more research, I decided that he is the right man for the show for a totally different reason. And here it is. 
is gifted with an incredibly strong oh, that said that his wife was gifted. strong body they realized in uh, when she was three years old that she had unusual strength and she had amazing flexibility they immediately put her in gymnastics and for 11 years she was a star and she was working on this one routine a double back flip and she just has to get enough speed enough lift well she got a bad bounce she landed on her neck like a diver lands into a pool she became quadriplegic in a snap. All her potential, gone. And as she lay there now, a prisoner in her own body, her family grieving around her, she had this remarkable joy. And as the months and even years went by and her gymnastics friends went elsewhere, she still had joy. But I remember looking at her for the first time, I thought, man, why is such a pretty girl in a wheelchair? That's the first thing I thought. And the second thing I thought is, I think this is my wife. Ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. She just had this heart that beamed as bright as the sun. And I remember thinking, wow. So I asked her, gosh, it's a really bummer you're in a wheelchair. She says, it's not that bad. I said, no, it's really bad. Like, she says, no, I get great parking, you know. I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. She says, yeah, I get on the front of roller coasters. I, you should definitely go to Disney World with me. She says, I, I'll get you right at the front of the line. I said, that's kind of like the upside to the letdown. You, you see the good and the bad. She says, I have to. I remember thinking, should I really marry her? This chair is gonna be there in my life forever. I mean, it's a real hardship. Thank God I had the wisdom at 19 years old to have the same mentality she had. I love this girl. She is the best mother to my two boys. She homeschools them and has given them a love for learning and a love for God. She cares for our home and makes it beautiful. For 20 years, she's managed all of my bookings and she balances our household budget. I wouldn't know what to do without her. She takes care of her body and she suffers through chronic pain without complaint. After 25 years of being in that chair, she's defied paralysis and fights every day to walk again. And even if she doesn't, she still has joy. She's the love of my life, my common sense counselor, my lifelong friend. I love this girl. She just happens to be sitting all the time. It's her heart that matters. Where else am I going to find a girl like this? Are you kidding? I love this chair. Why? Because it's a, it's a repellent for shallow dudes. That's what the chair is. Her chair is a repellent for shallow dudes that don't see the treasure that's sitting down. <laughs> so, Thanks, man. Hey, listen, I watched that and I said, this guy's going to teach us how to be a mensch. I'm having him on the show, clinical or not. <laughs> That's beautiful. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your your tender heart and your sensitivity to uh, to true love when you see it. And, and I think th what we're talking about tonight uh, is very relevant. And I teach this especially to my high school audiences. Resilience, emotional resilience is one of the most attractive traits on planet earth the ability to leverage adversity for psychological growth that is awesome i never i never actually thought of it that way but people are attracted to those who are easy to those who uh, aren't phased you know by by the comments and the hurts of others people are really attracted to those kinds of people who see the upside to the letdown the good and the bad and it's it's not it's not lying to yourself that, oh, no, there's a good thing that happened. It may be a bad thing that happened, but there can be good from it. It's like post-traumatic growth. And that's a mindset that I really find myself teaching students. Because uh, I've had five stepmom, four stepmoms. My, dad, my dad's been married and divorced, married and divorced. And I knew, man, if I wanted to find a woman who, who would be able to get through the difficult times that I know are inevitable part of life. And she had that trait besides that she's beautiful and she has a wonderful spirit she had this stick to itiveness and this incredible you know optimism and i just it, you know i was hooked and and i love her and i'm still in love with her and and uh, wow you know but thanks you were 19 for god's sake 
I was wise. <laughs> yes, I was wise. Okay. Well, that, that, that was just so touching and you should see what's coming in. I don't know if you're looking at the chat, but apparently I'm not the only one who has that sentiment. Okay. <laughs> so, awesome. so, so Brooks, teach us. Okay. Teach us how to be a mensch. How do we take a young man or young girl who's really struggling, who's feeling so insecure, who doesn't want to go to school anymore, who's burying their heads deeper in the pillow, whose pain in their heart is growing because other kids are snickering at them, uh, you know, even just, you know, being mean to them. Well, there's so much that goes on in bullying. How do we take a child and develop that resilience? Sure. The very first thing I do is when a kid says, I've been bullied, I say, what happened? What happened? I don't let kids call it bullying. When they believe they've been bullied, they have been conditioned to believe that they have, uh, they're a victim of a crime because it's against the law to be bullied. And if they've been bullied, and yet it's a catch-all phrase. I heard, I heard one teacher say before she introduced me to speak, she says, children, today our speaker is going to talk about bullying. And bullying is everything from eye rolling to the Holocaust. It's a spectrum. I got up there and I said, no, eye rolling is a rude gesture. The Holocaust is mass genocide. One is aimed at hurting your feelings. The other is aimed at ridding an entire people group off the face of the earth. It's murder, mass murder. I said, so that's, the, that's what kids believe though. They believe that speech is violence. And so I don't let a kid ever say the word bully. I just don't. So that's the first step. I always say if a school really wants to minimize their bullying complaints, get rid of the word. Well, then they say, what do we call it? And I say, well, call it what it is. Did someone say something to you? That's a top left quadrant. Did someone do something to you? That's a top right quadrant. Did someone say something to someone else about you? That's the bottom left quadrant. Or did someone do something with someone else without you? That's the bottom right quadrant. And that's the four categories of aggression. Verbal direct, that's top left. And that includes criticizing or teasing or name calling. Uh, pushing, shoving, or even flipping the bird gesturing. That's nonverbal, but directly to you. That's a top right quadrant. The bottom left is gossip and rumors or online trolling. And the bottom right is um, ignoring, avoiding, or excluding. You know, so, so, so what happened? I find that when I get the kid to describe what happened specifically, specifically what they're most offended by, it may be all those things that happened, but only one or two of those areas they're really offended by. So I need to find the source of offense. Just by mentioning it, mentioning it, it can be managed. That's what, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Rogers says, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. He knew something about child development. And so I, I lower the, uh, the, I guess, level of offense simply by specifically saying what exactly happened. And then I have a very, that's, I only have three steps. That's the first step. Let's just get, <laughs> what's offending you, bro? The second step is really a, a rational motive behavioral uh, therapeutic technique, which is um, how do you feel? And I have this emoji meter. You can screen grab it later if you'd like. But uh, are you mad? And that's the red left area. Are you sad? That's the sort of orangish area. Are you meh, indifferent? That's the yellow area. Are you glad that they excluded you? Let's say that's the situation. And I have the children really focus on the arms, not so much the expression, because I'm trying to connect their thoughts to their emotions. And Dr. Albert Ellis always taught the more rigid your demands are, like the red demanding guy there on the left, the more disturbed you are. Uh, but you could have desire, like in the kind of orangey area. Uh, but if you have desire, you'll just be disappointed if what you desired happened didn't, you know. If you're indifferent, you have no, you know, feelings one way or the other. And you could actually consider yourself advantageous that this happened. And so that's really important is to gauge the level of disturbance of the child. And my ultimate goal is to give up the grip of their irrational demands. So how do I move them from mad to sad to meh to glad? Because that's what I want to do. And I do that through three very simple questions. The first from mad to sad, I ask them, how could this have been worse? Or have you ever experienced something worse than this? Or have you ever seen someone go through something like this, but even it, it was worse? I need them to compare their unwanted event against the backdrop of something that could be worse. And just by doing that, it lowers their rock bottom threshold. 
and they feel less livid or mad about it. Uh, it, it's a wonderful technique. How could this have been worse? The second question I asked to go from sad to met, which is indifference is, um, why won't this matter in your future? It's a leading question that uh, it obviously leads them to, well, I guess, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I'll do something else this weekend if they excluded me. It really doesn't matter in my future. It's not gonna matter you know, six months from now. And I'll even say, yes, that's right. Remember last year when you were excluded from that party? How many, how long did you think about it? Oh, probably two, three days. Well, you'll probably forget about this one too. And the third and final question I asked him to go from met to actually glad is, hey, how could this turn out for your good? How could this turn out for your good? And man, that really is a mind screw for them. And uh, kids who can get there uh, are, are in, in, in my experience, cured from that particular offense. Because they're like, hey, this is actually a good thing. I, this is, I can do this you know, with, with my time instead. So how could this be worse? Why won't it matter in my future? How could this turn out for my good? Those three questions help them give up the grip of That's their almost, It almost demand. creates like a cognitive transformation for them. Yeah, it does. The, 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 the view that they had it at one point was catastrophic, which yes. we know is a, is a distortion. Uh, but now they realize they're advantageous. What a, it's a complete lens flip. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's the second phase. And it's sometimes though, Moshi, I have to admit that, uh, they're not, uh, they're not in manic mode. Kids are not available or as able to be as, uh, cognitively aware or, uh, or influenced. Uh, yeah, I agree. And so they're really just hell bent on being upset about it. Um, and so I, this is where Dr. Albert Ellis has a tremendous amount of help. He says, really, the reason why kids are so hell bent on being mad about something, if they're mad at themselves, it's because of one of two things. I must perform perfectly well and receive approval from important people or I'm inadequate. They're fighting that self-loathing inadequacy because they're not perfect and they're, they're approval addicts and they're not getting what they're desperately desiring, which is approval from people they deem as important. So that's one way I pry their fingers away from their grip if they're in manic mode, is I focus on what, what, where's the perfectionism here? What, what are you trying to do that, 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 that perfectly well that you're not able to do? And, and who are you trying to please or get approval from? And if, if I could help them release that, I guess like a chiropractor who wants to correct your neck needs to loosen up some muscles in your back first. Sometimes that's what I have to do for them to give up the grip of their demands. Uh, the second thing he says, if we are irrationally mad at someone else, well, that's only two things. And that is, well, uh, you must be fair and not frustrate my goals or you deserve punishment. So fairness and frustration are the two areas that uh, we find kids have irrational demands if they're mad at someone else. They really have this irrational belief that there must be fairness uh, or they believe they some, someone should help them, but instead they're blocking their goal. And so I help them understand that life is not fair. And the only thing fair about life is that it's unfair for everybody. And uh, I also help them understand that uh, sometimes when someone's blocking your goal and not helping you, that's one of the best things that can happen because it makes you be creative to get your end goal another way. It's just, it's just a challenge. Don't give and up. Brooks, and what happens when you have kids who aren't that insightful? I mean, you, there is a certain degree of insight that a child needs to recognize their inflexibility, their rigidness. Um, what happens when you have children who are just like, I don't care, I'm mad at what he did and I just want to beat him up and, or I'm, I'm depressed because they made fun of me, uh, you know, and they're not as uh, insightful. I think the person that needs to be insightful is the therapist and the therapist can, um, I believe through, I know everyone's different. Everyone has a different personality and they do therapy, you know, different, but we try to work from the same framework. And, and here's what I do know. We have to lead the children to this illumination, uh, through creative means if necessary. And it I may see. take more than one session. I see so there's no other route to go. They're either a perfectionist or an approval addict. They either have a fairness construct or they have uh, low frustration tolerance. Or the, the third area, if I'm mad at life, it's life must be comfortable and turn out how I envision. 
idealism, or it's unbearable. So when it comes to their life view, they they either uh, they have idealism that they're struggling from, or they have low tolerance for being uncomfortable. So the, we bring our insightfulness there, and we know that for a child to give up the grip, they have to just desire and not demand those things. Right now they're demanding, and that's the only reason. There is something Izzy did that is pretty awesome uh, to make, a, to, I guess, illuminate the child's thinking. And he, he used the term winning and losing, uh, which leads me to the th third and final step. I'll, I'll show you this diagram. Remember the first thing I say, what happened? I help them describe exactly what they're offended by. The second step is I say, how do you feel? Are you mad, sad, mad, or glad? And I try to use thinking, uh, I, you know, questions. Why won't this matter in your, I mean, sorry, how could this be worse? Why wouldn't it matter in the future? How could this turn out for your good? But then I try to find out, and this is where the simplicity of helping a kid, he doesn't have to be insightful. Why did they do this? Were they trying to bother you? Were they joking with you? Or were they hurt by you? Now, they'll say, well, they're trying to bother me. And this is how Izzy put it. And he says, uh, when they call you names, right? And your feelings are hurt and you get really angry or upset. How do you feel? Do you feel like a winner? Or do you feel like a loser? And the kid says, well, I feel like a loser. And you're like, that's right. And when you feel like a loser, how do they feel? Like a winner or loser? Well, they feel like a winner. That's right, because they want you to lose. They want you to get upset. And if you get upset, you lose and they win. Do you want them to win every time they're mean to you? No. Do you want to be a perpetual loser every time they're mean to you? No. Do you want me to tell you how to stop losing? Yeah. So there's, the, there's the motivation. There's the motivation. He's yeah. breeding motivation by having the child a desire to be a winner and have having him desire that his aggressor be a loser. They they already have that, uh, I would call it a, a debase natural desire to dominate themselves and certainly not to be dominated. Mm -hmm. And every child has been conditioned to play games and to play to win, right? And so the winning and losing is already embedded in the child at any cognitive level, including on the spectrum of autism, for example. So yes, winning and losing is a brilliant way to make it really simple. And then you say, well, how do I stop losing? And how do I win? Well, stop, getting, stop giving them what they want. Stop getting upset. So they say, I hate your guts. Every time you get upset, shut up, you lose. You're hurting my feelings. That's the point, dummy. Stop it, never. See, and when, when you're getting upset and you're losing and they're winning, when kids win games, they play the games again and again and again and again and again. So it is an imbalance of power and tend to do harm repeated over time because it's a game, a game of winning and losing. So if the problem is that you're getting upset, then the solution is stop getting upset. I hate your guts. That's nice. Then they'll lose. You smell like body odor. You need a bath. Thanks for the information. And right before they <laughs> leave you alone, they'll be as mean as they can be. Your face is ugly. You have a face of an angel, sweet cheeks. And then they'll leave you the heck alone. I hate you. I love you. Don't get upset. Treat them like a friend. And that's dealing with the top, you know, uh, uh, emoji here, which is the botherer or what people today call bullying. That's how you respond in terms of winning and losing. But Moshi, uh, I do think it's important to understand that um, a child cannot be in that state of uh, receptivity until he gives up the grip of his demands. Uh, it's okay if he's disappointed, kind of that sad guy. I can teach a kid who's sad, but if he's hell bent on being mad with retali retaliatory vengeance, I need to do a little deeper work. Okay, so I, I, I think area. this is probably the mistake that I make when working with children is, is missing that step right there because we want to jump into sort of convincing them look just look if this guy's bullying you and aggressing you and you keep fighting back and he keeps dominating more then you must be you must do something else i mean you gotta just and the, and the kids don't seem receptive to it they're like no i'm gonna beat him up i'm gonna come with a, with a knife from the little you know and and uh i think this that, that might be the step where i'm missing i don't know about others experience here but that, that must be the step that's missing Right. So whatever specific area that they have developed the demand that that should not happen to them, whether someone calls them a name, pushes them around, tells their secrets to the new kids in town, leaves them out with no friends to be found, whatever happened, 
they have developed a demand, Albert Ellis would say an irrational demand, that that absolutely must never uh, happen. Yes. And that's their A, B, C, right? A, the activating event or an aggression, uh, creates C, an emotional consequence, based on their B, their belief system. And so the therapist has to focus on the B, not the A, what happened, and not the C, how do you feel about it really, but really it's the B, what do you believe about what they did? And that's what I need you to see yourself advantageous. It could actually be a good thing that they did this. Like a, like a boxer needs a good sparring partner in the ring to get better. You need a hater or a jerk in your life to learn how to deal with difficult people. This is an opportunity to build a resilience. That's how I'm viewing it. Brooks, is it my imagination? But what I, in my personal life, when I've used this kind of technique, when I've been mindful, you know, to respond appropriately to aggressors, you can actually make real friends out of these aggressors because they, there's something about, there's something secure and calming for them uh, in that you don't fall prey to their trick. They can't provoke you. They may have a, a perpetual, um, uh, poor relational skills that they're, that they're enacting with other people and somebody's finally treating them differently. And rather than exploding at them, fighting or avoiding them is actually leaning in towards them and saying, and saying, you know, you have the face of an angel, sweet cheeks. Like you said, to that girl, <laughs> like you said to that girl on stage. That's right. You know, that's why Izzy Kalman called his organization bullies to buddies yes. because he recognized the wisdom of the Stoic philosophers and the wisdom of uh, the, the great religious teachers uh, of, throughout millennia. Um, and even Abraham Lincoln, who says, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? Uh, we are all, I guess, um, wired for reciprocity. And it's, it, I, I guess it's in our amygdala and our uh, parasympathetic nervous system and our sympathetic nervous, the anatomic system, where the fight or flight reflex, that whole thing, and, and when someone's nice to us, we want to be nice back. When someone's mean to us, we want to be mean back. And so when you're not getting upset with a mean person and, and you're treating them like a friend, they have this weird crisis of conscience because on one hand, they're wanting to stay mean. But on the other hand, that reciprocity starts to work to your advantage and they want to be nice back to you. And so it is true. We, when we treat people like friends, we don't have to be their friends, but we're friendly to them. They have a hard time staying mean and they appreciate it because that's how they want to be treated. Yeah. You know, one of the things I teach kids, one of the examples that I give them uh, is I say, if somebody says to you, you're so fat, you want to say to them, I know I have to walk sideways out the door. In, in other words, I use a technique that I call emphasizing. So you're not only agreeing with the bully or sort of, you know, sw swiping them off but you're actually emphasizing what they're saying. And it's a form of handing them the power. But you want to dominate? Oh, I didn't realize. Here, go ahead, dominate. Here's, here's, a, here's a silver platter to dominate on. And it actually takes the whole blow out of, out of the punch uh, and, and, you know, and can do that. So, um, I, you know, so an emotionally healthy person can take and make a joke about themselves. They know they're not right. They know they have flaws and, um, and they're comfortable in their own skin. And they can take and make a joke about it. So yes, I think that's a, yeah, I don't have to wear a sweater in the winter. I'm fat, you know, uh, I give really warm hugs. Why don't you come here and get a, get one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we admire people who can endure roasts and so do other people. Right. Right. Okay. Let, let's take a question from Aaron Herzog. Aaron, thank you again for reaching out to Brooks and, and, um, uh, I don't know what you did to convince him to come on if it was just a request, but thanks for being that active and, Go ahead. Let's let's hear your question. Oh, you're still muted. Go ahead. Hi, hi, Brooks. Thanks for coming out. So um, the reason why I was looking for you is because I have two clients who actually are bullied, shall we call it. So one is I, I viewed very serious bullying because there's a kink in the class. And he has ministers, so everybody has to please the kink. And he, and this child is like the outsider in the class. So it's a systematic bullying. So I was wondering what you were talking today. How would you treat it? Like if this client comes into your to your office. Uh, Aaron, who does the uh, does this bother uh, your client? So he's only eight years old. 
but he told me, he calls him a, like a Purim rope. I don't know if you have a holiday Purim, which is basically, I don't know if you know what Purim is. It's like basically, so he's like a Purim king. Like, no, but the teacher told me that he's like, sits you know, quietly in the corner. And he's... But again, I got to ask Aaron, you know, is he disturbed by it? Does it bother him? I know he denies it, but I know it bothers him. How do you know? Because he is alone the whole time and he keeps on saying how a bad person the bullying bullier is and you know how but he also hits him from time to time yeah okay uh the reason why i ask and i emphasize that is because man let's not disturb children who are not disturbed i tell right. parents this all the time you know uh it, we we ruin our kids uh, many times by telling them they, they're being victimized and they have to, this is intolerable and we should have no tolerance for intolerance, which is a logical absurdity. So, you know, uh, if, if it's not bothered, great. Cause that's exactly what we want to teach him. We want to, we want him to be happy with who he is at eight years old and have maybe one friend. There's nothing wrong with one friend. Um, uh, there's even seasons of solitude that are just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it doesn't always have to be a boy that's our friend. It could be a girl that's our friend, or it could be a teacher that's our friend. So I'm always, as a therapist, going to feel out the disturbance element, you know. And so if I trust you, Aaron, I trust that you do see he's disturbed. Uh, and he's lying, really, about it, it doesn't bother him uh, because he shows uh, a, hatred. Uh, and a desire for revenge, perhaps. And anger, hatred, and desire for revenge are symptoms of victimization. And these are the most dangerous people on earth, people who feel like victims. So uh, we want him to view that kid um, in a different light, you know, and, and to be able to say, you know, what is that boy doing that bothers you? And be very specific. And it's going to be one of those four categories. He excludes me. From the group it's just what i'm hearing from you this child is being excluded from the rest of the population and if that really does bother the child then um you know i would i would say um you know well i would use my so how could this be worse you you could be kicked out of the school completely right i mean that that would be really tough or no one would be even allowed to look at you or talk to you you wouldn't be able to be in the class well, why won't this really matter in your future? Well, you're eight years old and you know, you're going to find friends and, and this class isn't forever. And uh, thank goodness it ends at 3.30 and you go home and you got friends and you just get out of it. <laughs> and so it's just a sort of a miserable morning with a little bit of afternoon. So it doesn't really have a huge impact. Well, how could this actually turn out for your good? You know, and say that being sort of on the outside, you know, mental health is the ability to adjust to a harsh reality. And sometimes there are harsh realities that the culture is already developed in that classroom. And this one coming in that is being ousted needs to learn how to be happy in a very seemingly hostile culture. And so I would maybe even talk to him about what a gorilla does that's a foster gorilla. He doesn't immediately go in to the culture. He stays on the outskirts until one comes and adopts him and brings him in or folds him in. So the best thing that he can do is go to school with a friendly heart because a man who has friends must show himself friendly as the great proverb says. And so how do you be friendly? Well, you, you go to school every day saying, I'm better than everyone at something and I'm going to tell them how. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not what you do. That's a good way to be left out. You're obnoxious. You should instead go to school every day and say, everyone's better than me at something and I'm going to find out how. And so you teach him to engage with this basic social skill of asking questions that of other people's interests. And I have an acronym real quick, friend, talk about their family. You know, how many brothers, sisters do you have? Talk about recreation. What do you like to do for fun? Talked about industry. What do you want to do when you grow up? What did your parents do for a living? Talk about education. What's your favorite subject? What do you like to learn? Talk about needs or desires. Is there anything I can help you with? And what about dreams and aspirations, right? So F-R-I-E-N-D-S, that's my acronym to get people to talk about themselves in, in that way. So I teach that child how to make a friend and how to be a friend 
And next thing you know, he'll be swatting friends off left and right. He hasn't been taught. Well, a person who has friends must first show themselves friendly and not wait for other people to initiate the friendliness. They just won't do that when a culture is solidified. Okay, thanks for the question. Brooks, do you, um, do you take into account hurt? You know, you use the term angry, angry, indifferent, mad, you know, what about, I, I think the, the experience that most people who are victims are feeling is hurt. They feel isolated, abandoned, left out, and uh, insulted and hurt and really badly about themselves. Are you, are you assuming that hurt turns into anger or are you using anger for a particular reason? Because sometimes when people are so hurt, they, they can't ever see themselves, you know, leaning in and becoming proactive in responding differently. They're just so hurt. They just want to bury themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, hurt is uh, actually a part of the aggression trifecta. If, if you remember this, you've got your... <clears throat> motivation behind aggression. Why are people mean? Well, they're either trying to bother you, dominance behavior, they're trying to joke with you, that's humor, comedian type stuff, or they're hurt by you and they want to retaliate or see you punished. They're hurt. And so this is the, uh, this is, this is actually a big reason why we, we react in such, in su such, uh, uh, destructive ways, you know, aggressive ways. Um, but I, I go back to the emoji meter and I say the reason why we're hurt is because uh, we believe that they must not do that or we have a desire that they please don't do that when we really should be indifferent or consider ourselves advantageous if they do do that. So the left side of the spectrum, the irrational demands, you must not do that or the desire, please, please, please don't do that. That is why we find ourselves hurt. Um, because we still have an expectation that it should, must not, hope not, I hope it doesn't happen. So I don't focus so much on uh, the exact, uh, you know, feeling wheel right. that a lot of therapists try to, you know, identify and articulate. Some kids that I work with have, uh, you know, alexithymia, which is emotional blindness because they're 64% of kids that are autistic have alexithymia. And, and, and they can't identify or see or even speak their emotions. And I find that they still have success when we just help them understand the laws that govern aggression. you right. He's either trying to say something, do something, say something to someone else or do something to so, you know, with someone else without you. And are you mad, sad, mad or glad? And why do you think they did that? Are they trying to bother you, joke with you or are they hurt by you? Well, here's how you respond. If they're bothering you, don't get upset. Treat them like a friend. If they're trying to joke with you, don't get upset and laugh. If they're hurt by you, don't get upset and apologize. So when we're dealing with someone who's hurt, uh, let's say, let's say the, our client identifies that the aggressor is actually hurt, then we say, okay, well then apologize. But I know what you're asking. You're saying, well, what about when our client is hurt? Yes. And I'd say, well, believe it or not, your client, has probably been called a bully by the other kids in the classroom. They view your client as the aggressor. And it's that hurt victimization feeling that actually motivates the worst types of aggression on yes. earth. Yeah, and that's that's so, why I think it's so important to, to address this because the pe who are the people who are, you know, blowing up school, shooting up schools or who are wreaking a lot of havoc? It's those who feel so hurt, like you started off the session talking about. Right. And I, I don't see any reason to go beyond this. Are, are you demanding that they must not do that? They must not say that to you? Or do you have a desire that they please don't do that? Please don't say that. Either way, you've got a demand or a desire. And, 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 it, 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 and the higher your expectations or demands, the harder the fall. You know, so how they process it emotionally, whether they take it personal and they find hurt. Uh, that is simply, I guess, maybe their emotional pattern. Uh, but the root behind all that is their demand or desire in their belief system that has produced the emotional consequence of hurt. And I don't spend much time on hurt. I just focus on their expectations, their demands or desires of that particular specific behavior 
and help them give up the grip and actually be glad that that specific behavior happened and the hurt dissipates or any other negative emotion there. So, so as what's, what's neat about this, you know, this kind of answers one of my questions that I've been in one of your uh, talks online, actually in that one with, with that uh, teenage girl that you demonstrated with, um, you said people ask you all the time, doesn't a child have to have strong self-esteem in order to be able to execute something like this? Because you really have to be balanced enough uh, when somebody throws a punch at you, so to say, to be able to respond uh, flippantly or or humorously or whatever it is. And I think I think what I'm hearing you say tonight is if somebody could learn the skill, they could sort of um, detonate the, the the bomb. So they don't actually have to have strong self-esteem innately. They can just learn how to detonate the bomb behaviorally. Which is which is ridding themselves of an offense. You know, the, the only thing we need to even be talking about when a client comes to us with a social problem is why are you offended by it? Why are you offended by it? You know, in, unless a crime has been committed, which I do believe we should have demands that no one can rape me or attempt to murder me or take my stuff and vandalize it or steal it, stuff like that. We should have demands for certain things, but it's very few things. But when it's just, when it's just aimed at hurting my feelings, why, why are you upset about it? That's the detonate. What, what did you call it? Detonating? To detonate, to detonate the bomb. The detonator, yeah. I guess. Now, does to detonate help me a little bit? Does that mean to diffuse to like to, or does that mean to make it explode? No, to diffuse. Yeah. If to you, if you the, mean, if, yeah, to detonate the, like if there's a, you find a mine and you detonate it, you uh, undo it. Right. Right. And, and look, I, I look at every offense as an opportunity to build resilience every conflict as an opportunity to build resilience. And I, I'm telling you, man, I've gotten so quick and so fast at helping kids because these are what I'd shared with you today, 22 years, been doing this, had some of the greatest mentors. I mean, Izzy Kalman's world, world renowned. And he, he became one of, well, he's my content father. I mean, he says, I teach his stuff better than he can teach it. And that's what he says. Uh, so I, I, I absolutely love what I teach. I'm so fast at finding exactly the behavior that they find offensive and helping them to rethink it so they consider themselves advantageous that it actually happened and the problem solved. And that's what we want to do with children. Wow. Okay. Well, actually, detonate actually means to cause it to explode. But I, I, I misused, thought so. <laughs> I misused the word, but you were, you were Just to be clear. Okay. gentlemanly about that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's take a question. We have a few questions. Nahum Spurn. Go ahead, Nahum. Thank you. Uh, Brooks, I've seen some of your stuff and Izzy's online. It's a real pleasure to see you in person. Thank you. Um, what would you say for someone, a girl who did not have the skills that we are talking about this evening and, uh, and felt very bullied and very victimized, shut down emotionally, and two years later is having significant mental health issues of being all shut down emotionally and, and even more significantly because of those experiences from the past Mm. Thank you for your question. Uh, you know, they, she has developed a pattern of thought uh, where she continues to disturb herself and she's uh, seemingly uh, hopelessly caught in a, um, a, a negative interpretation of what happened to her in her past. Uh, the Stoics said it's not what happens to you that disturbs you, but your interpretation of what happens to you that disturbs you. Yes. And so it's her view of life and her view of the happenings in her life. And so, you know, I'm a big fan of teaching kids, although I wish there was an easy way, way to teach it. I'm working on it. Uh, the basic cognitive distortions. These are the, the negative, automatic negative thinking patterns like future telling and mind reading and catastrophizing and, uh, and uh, black and white, you know, dichotomous thinking and things like this. You know, I, I would really, with flashcards, uh, teach her how to identify these thinking errors and then to, if, if you have regular meetings with her, uh, to be able to uh, see if she's able to identify which one she goes to the most, right? Because she has developed this pattern of interpreting reality in such a destructive, negative way that she can't even see reality in its, in its uh, beautiful uh, light, flaws and all. 
So that, that's the first thing is work on her distortions and then go back to the very thing that victimized her and help her consider, help her view that as uh, from an advantageous perspective using the three questions that I suggested, whatever that was. Um, uh, and I, I really, I, I, I would focus on the thinking. Um, I don't know that um, w w when we see kids acting out, does she develop an eating disorder? Is she cutting? Is there non-suicidal self-injurious behavior? Is there uh, suicidal ideation? Is she acting out in any way? No, but I was uh, uh, offended on her behalf, if you don't mind, when you said that the person who was victimized herself probably was the one who caused pain to the others. Um, my client wouldn't hurt a fly. I never hurt a fly. Uh, so um, it is true, though, that the worst acts of violence are committed by people who feel like victims. They're hurt. So well, you, also, that's... Brooke, you also you also commented that that oftentimes people are saying about the victim that they're bullies. That not, they're not necessarily the aggressor, but others are complaining about them that they're aggressor. Others are perceiving them as the aggressor. The victim experiences him or herself as a victim. So, right. And just because someone feels victimized, and even if they're a true victim, it doesn't mean they retaliate and create worse acts of violence and they don't, they're not going to gain a reputation of being the school bully, right? Uh, but I'm saying one thing that um, all homicides and suicides have in common, the worst acts of violence, is the individual's hurt and feels victimized. So that's the only thing. I'm not saying all victims retaliate, but all retaliation comes from victimization, if that makes sense. You can't have retaliation without victimization, but you can have victimization without retaliation. So, uh, and, and, and to the gentleman who was asking the question, I wish I could... Uh, go back to his. Why don't you say hi so that my screen can pick hi. up your screen? Hi. Okay, perfect. Um, Nahum, um, you know, don't take offense for her. <laughs> you know what I mean? I uh, That's what I spend my life trying to do is help rid people of their offenses. But why you heard my answer, Nahum, let's just get to it. Uh, we're, we're, she, she is disturbing herself in her uh, view of her past happenings and her current reality. Would you agree with that or not? I can only see it to an extent, I guess. You know, I took the Albert Ellis training and he speaks about getting rid of the musts and shoulds and turn that terror, that very strong feeling into a milder one by turning it into a gentler feeling. He doesn't say you can get rid of that you should or <laughs> they, to get rid of the desire. You said that the problem is coming from, from the shoulds and turn that into a desire that will make it easier and lighter. And then you took it a step further, which I don't think Albert Ellis ever said, is not to have the desire either. We all have the desires and we are, in the training that I received, it was don't be all mad, but it's okay to be a little upset. Sure, yeah. And you know, I if you look at this, I always tell kids to live, live in the middle, um, which is in between a little bit of desire and a little bit of indifference, right? When it comes to unwanted behavior. And so let's say this girl is excluded. Let's say that's her big deal. And there's two girls that she really wants to hang out with. Well, if she has a little desire, she's gonna feel negative feelings of disappointment and sadness. Mm -hmm. And that's good, that's a human feeling. To live life without desire is no life at all. You know, we're to have desires. But as soon as we realize that there's a harsh reality that's not changing, we need to also have the coping skills to leverage that negative adversity for psychological growth which is the definition of resilience. Resilience is leveraging negative adversity, which is really all adversity, I guess, is negative, um, for psychological growth. It yes. doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. So perhaps that's an element that's missing, is her discipline in her mind to see the good in every bad uh, and, and getting really good at rebounding and saying, actually, this is to my advantage because the most successful people on earth have learned to exploit unwanted negative events to their advantage because they've disciplined in their mind to do so. So I still think if someone's suffering, they've got a thinking problem. We'll start with her automatic negative thinking patterns or distortions, cognitive distortions. Uh, Beck did a lot on this. Burns in his book, Feeling Good, 
did a lot about this. And also, uh, believe it or not, uh, Ellis did a lot about this. Uh, but in addition to that, we need to train our brain to see the good so she feels like the most blessed person on earth. If I may say something really quick uh, about this, I, 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 I think this is a, a Jewish community, or some are. Is that correct, Moshi? Yeah, uh, most. Yeah, some. Th th there's this passage in the book of uh, the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, he had a scribe named Baruch, and uh, I believe it's the 45th chapter, uh, and Baruch was complaining, and, uh, and God spoke uh, to Jeremiah concerning Baruch, uh, by the way, Baruch is how uh, Hispanics say my name, Brooks. <laughs> That's I always identify with Baruch. He's like me. <laughs> and so I, he says, uh, Baruch, uh, you're saying, woe is me. There's self-loathing. The Lord has added grief to my sorrow. So there's blame. Uh, I sigh in my, or uh, I faint in my sighing. So there's uh, anxiety attack, panic disorder. And I find no rest. So there's sleep deprivation, which is, uh, could be a sign of depression. So we have clinical anxiety uh, and depression, and we have uh, chronic blame and not taking personal responsibility for his own uh, contribution. And we have self-loathing. Uh, this guy's a mess. I mean, he needs therapy. And so what does God say to Baruch? <laughs> and he says, hey, look, I do what I want. Just kind of what he said to Job. He says, what I plant, I pluck up. What I build, I can tear down. What is that to you? I, I'm, if I want to do this to, the, to this nation, speaking of Jude, Judah at that particular time, I believe. Um, and then he finally says, and this is the cure, this is the medicine, the, the God, the inventor of cognitive behavioral therapy. This is, this is what he said. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not, for I will give you your life as a prize wherever you go. So we have grandiosity that was at the root of Brooks' problem. He had high expectations of what his life should turn out like and what the nation of Israel should experience and all this kind of stuff. And instead, God advised him to just, just lower your expectations, be happy and content with your life, and view it as a prize. Consider yourself advantageous, even if it seems you're like you're living hell on earth and you're about to be you know, a kid not by Nebuchadnezzar, you know, uh, for 70 years or something in another nation. Uh, I'm still God. I'm still at work. And your life is a prize. Be thankful for the breath in your lungs. And I teach kids all the time. If you lose the love of your life, you can still possess the love for your life. That's why you need to learn to fall in love with life and all its goodness and be, have an attitude of gratitude. Wow. Brooks, let's take a couple more questions. Raisy, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, I actually, Mr. Norman showed us some of your stuff like a while back in supervision. So I was really excited to see you live and I'm really enjoying it. I'm learning so much. Thank you. Um, my question was, what happens when it's, you know, the bullying or however you want to call it is, with an adult to a child. Um, so uh, the case in point that I have in mind is a kid that I actually saw once, I just started working with him in a school and the kid had been complaining that boys are laughing at him. He's like this grony little kid with a little bit crooked teeth, you know? And it's like a big class of tough boys, third grade class. And okay, so then I'm, I'm about to call him out. Suddenly he's in the principal's office. So what happened? A boy had got sent out for laughing at him. And when the boy said the story, it turns out the teacher had, the teacher is like a very uh, old school kind of teacher. Sarcastic. Like, yeah, not not very much bedside manner. But, uh, you yeah, know, probably punitive, right? Exactly. So basically the teacher, it seems, I don't know what his intent was. I don't know if he couldn't hear the child properly. He wanted to hear his answer better. He lifted the child up almost like a baby. So of course the boys laugh. This is already a kid with you know low self-esteem who the kids are laughing at and teacher lifting up the kid. So my question is like, what happens then? Like it's 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 hard to tell a kid to, you know, just man up and tough up and, and whatever when it's coming from an adult. That is my question. Yeah. 
you know, the, the same laws that govern child aggression also uh, govern uh, student aggression. And we have to ask ourselves, why did they do that behavior? Were they trying to bother you? Well, in this case, no. Were yeah. they trying to joke with you? Well, yes, of course, they were joking and you were at your expense. Or were they hurt by you? Well, no, I don't think that the coach is hurt or whatever, but he was trying to make a joke and is at your expense. Unfortunately, this child uh, has a poor developed sense of humor. He's insecure about his uh, inadequacies. Uh, he wishes he was different and uh, maybe like the other boys who've hit puberty early or, or at least, you know, uh, more handsome or whatever the case is. And so we honestly, the only solution is to rid the child of his offense. We could try to talk to the coach and say, can you please not use him as a joke? And I would have that conversation. I would say, you know, the number one goal of a comedian is to make its audience what? And the coach would say, laugh. I said, right. Uh, but in this case, your audience cried. So you fail. <laughs> you really need to learn how to save your jokes for those who can handle it. And I'm just telling you right now, this kid's not your audience. Uh, in the future, I hope he will be. I hope he'll be able to zing you right back and we'll work on that. But right now he's he's not i wouldn't try to punish uh uh the teacher because then guess what will happen now the coach who is just trying to be funny will now feel victimized by that student and will continue to be mean because he's hurt by that student that student made me have a reprimand from a higher up you know and so now we really have complicated the problem when it really was just a, a poor placed joke on a target that couldn't handle it. So we have to role play with that child. I have a game called uh, uh, LOL, which is like, hey, uh, you're going to make fun of me and I'm going to make fun of me better than you can make fun of me. Or will you just try to make fun of me and I'm going to try to make fun of me too. The point is the funniest person wins. And so you have him insult you, roast you. And you roast yourself. You have a big forehead. It's like a five head. Yeah, my nose is pointy. I don't have to point directions. I just say, go over there. People start laughing, you know, whatever. Um, and then you say, okay, now it's my turn. And you switch it and say, now I'm going to make fun of you. And you're going to make fun of you even better than I can make fun of you. Do you think you're ready? We're just playing a game. You have to, through rehearsal, uh, give him that game day scenario of that classroom moment so that he's prepared for it to laugh. And if he's not good at roasting himself, he could at least say this, <laughs> that's a good one. And so you could teach him how to respond. But ultimately, the only solution as far as I'm concerned, is to help that child learn to take and make a joke about himself. That's only where we're going to help him long term. Thank you so Brooks, much. That was we, really have, we have time for one or two more questions. I, I have to log out at 1020 the latest. Can we get one or two more in Shifi? Go and for it, man, please. Yeah, go ahead, Shifi. Hi, Brooks. So I'm intrigued. I have a 65 year old client who self reports as being bullied by her husband. Interestingly, her favorite like story that she loves to tell me and she keeps forgetting that she already told it to me. She doesn't have Alzheimer's is that when she was in middle school, she had a terrible bullying incident where she was like on the floor surrounded by a bunch of girls that were pulling her hair and her shoes and her um, and she's kind of stuck in that. And I can so see, I'm intrigued. Have you ever worked with adults? And, and would this process be effective? Yeah, one uh, adult I was working with uh, had this trauma from being in a porta potty at the top of a hill that some girls, when she was in high school, pushed down the hill. And she not only broke her, fractured her leg or something like that, but she was exposed with a bunch of uh, porta potty gunk all over her. And it was just a traumatic event. And those are really sad things. And so, you know, we definitely need to empathize uh, f for that, uh, but also find the gold in, in the sad moment. Uh, uh, we are, uh, we can only relate to people oftentimes by the things that we've experienced. And so when she can memorialize that sad moment and say, I'm, I, I have developed a heart for those who have been uh, assaulted by groups or feel outnumbered or feel like they can't go anywhere and see the virtue that comes from it. And I'm so proud of who I've become going through that. And I would focus on that, not the helplessness, not the moment she's, of torment. She's, she's super empathic with children. She's amazing. She's all, she's like, you know what, right then I would say, would there be a con connection to that empathy? 
and that event. And if she can make that connection, then she can memorialize that, right? Which is the final step of grief to be able to say, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, but if I had to go over again through life, I wouldn't change a thing because how it's shaped me. I'm just so proud of who I am because of that. And I would never let her get away with going back in the trauma of it. And you study post-traumatic growth, that's what they talk about. You, know, you have to go through trauma to experience PTG, post-traumatic growth, to see yourself as advantageous because of something so horribly wrong. I'm not saying it was right that it happened, but I'm saying good has come from it. And we have a lot of proof and we have to remind ourselves to focus on the good. Amazing. Okay, Aaron, take it away. Last question of the night. Hi. So today there is a movement in the therapy world that everybody has PTSD, a lot of trauma, we need a lot of healing. So we're basically victimizing everybody. So the question is, do you see it as a danger? Because as you told us, the victims are the most dangerous people. <laughs> yes, uh, this is the uh, a scariest time, I think, for humanity, uh, because we have, we have uh, uh, there's a thing called intersectionalism in cult culture that says the more victim cards you have, the more uh, woke you are, I guess, that woke mindset, and the more entitled you are, and the more moral authority you have in culture. And there's not a single strand uh, of a philosophy, there's no school of psychology that would ever support, there's no religion on earth that would support this new cult cultural victimization that people are obsessed on identifying as victims. So it's very dangerous. I'm not gonna change my message because I have thousands of years of wise people saying that this is the cure to happiness. This is the cure to depression. This is a key to happiness. It's to no longer view yourself as a victim. Um, and I'm not victim blaming, by the way. Someone asked that earlier. Uh, we don't blame people uh, unless they do something on purpose. And people who identify as a victim and are hurting are not hurting on purpose. They just don't know why they're hurting. So I don't blame them, but I do say, if you wanna stop hurting, it's your responsibility. And that's the big difference between blaming and placing responsibility. No one can help you feel better except yourself. And no one can make you feel terrible except yourself. So start taking responsibility. And in this day and age, it's a hard pill to swallow. Beautiful. Brooks, I, I just, you know, I wanna thank you for coming on tonight and really inspiring us. I mean, putting aside everything else, uh, the, the, the positive perspective, the, the faith that you seem to have in people, I think probably gives them more than the skills that you actually provide for them. And that's the, that's the sense and feeling I get in sitting here and listening to you talk. But um, uh, I think that the contribution of your phases and your perspective is really something that's going to help the, commu the you know, the child-based community in particular. And if kids, you know, you, you literally could save lives, whether it's emotional destruction or physical destruction or suicide, literally could save lives with, with helping children who are really suffering from this victimization. And so I really appreciate that you agreed to talk to us and uh, you brought, you know, you brought the mention you have for us to see. I'm just repeating the wisdom of the ages from great people like Izzy and Albert Ellis. So let's continue to honor our mentors and, 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 and kind of stand on the shoulders of, of, of great giants that, that we have. So thanks, Moshi. You're doing okay. great work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again and hope to be in touch with you in the future. Take care. Good night.